Great. Hello, members. This is Tom Morrison right here in Jacksonville, Florida, for your next edition of Heat Treat Live. Today, we're going to talk about the crazy world of energy. We're going to talk about energy policy, talk about energy strategies, and talk about energy efficiencies with two great, uh, two great people, Mike Payne from APPI Energy and uh, Kevin Graber from Honeywell Thermal Solutions. So before we get started, I would like to let everyone know as you're listening, you can see to your, should be on the right of your screen, there is a place called the panelists and attendees questions. I've put, post any questions here. In your bottom of your screen here on the right, you can click in there and type any comments, any questions that you would like to pose to the panelists as we go down this route talking about energy. Um, energy prices are being slated to go up next year, so now is the time to be thinking about these strategies and the efficiencies that we're going to talk about. Before we get hitting on the uh, energy level, though, I want to mention three big things going on with MTI right now. So we're about to launch next week, actually this week, our audit finding database. It's going to be the Google for NADCAP findings. It's not tied to anybody's name. Members that put in uh, their findings are going to be able to view all the other findings that are in the, in the clearinghouse of findings uh, as members log in, private, secure, password protected. They put in their audits with all their finding information, and you're going to be able to Google those, not Google them, you'll be able to keyword search them, and within the database, you can type in calibration. It'll bring you up all the findings that had calibration in it, and you can see the, um, how the findings worded out and, and whether they're major or minors and when they happen. So, Lots of good things in there. It's going to be great information for you to understand and improve your quality systems if you're in the aerospace industry. Also, uh, the MTI Educational Foundation, since the fall meeting in Indianapolis, Indiana, FNA 2018, the foundation between what uh, MTI has given, the matching funds, and what members have given has raised $112,600 in the last 30 days to go towards scholarships next year. So we're excited about the foundation board getting together in December and January and determining what they're going to do for the 2019 arena in terms of giving scholarships away. We gave away five scholarships for a total of $35,000 last year, and uh, the students were just absolutely amazed and very gracious and appreciative of that. So they're really working hard to get back in the metal treating industry. Um, the last thing is MTI is always committed to giving you, the member, great resources to help you improve your business. Finding workers is the number one hardest thing that's a drag on everybody's business in every single industry. And one of the things that we have found, stumbled upon this year is one of our speakers from the 2017 fall meeting, Mr. Jamie Nodder and his partner, Maddie Grant, who are experts in the field of employee workplace culture and employee engagement. They're launching their new book called The Non-Obvious Guide to Employing, uh, Employee Engagement. Totally focused on how do you engage your employees to get them excited about being at the office, to be literally your best recruiters of their friends and, and people that could come work in your place of business. So we're, the board has approved giving a copy of that book to every single member uh, starting the new year. So right now we're getting those printed up and they're going to be shipped out to y'all sometime in December and you'll get a copy of that one per company, one per plant. You're going to want to have every single manager tie in to the concepts in this book so you can really tag your employees in because you cannot afford to lose your big players. Why? Because there's nobody else to hire at under 3 4% unemployment. So exciting stuff going on with MTI. So right now, though, we want to talk about energy. Get on the energy bus, right, guys? Oh, yeah. So, so today we have with us Mike Payne from Appy Energy. They're our official energy provider uh, to MCI members. we got about 25 to 30 members on there by a fair amount of energy through them. And we got Kevin Graber from uh, Honeywell Thermal Solutions who's going to talk about energy efficiency. So guys, one at a time. So Mike, share with them who you are and kind of what's your background. Sure, Tom, and thanks for including me today, and members, thanks for your time today to join into this session. I'm very happy to be here and to share some information with you all. Uh, I'm one of the owners and founders of APPI Energy. My background is in law and investment banking, but I've been focused on the energy arena now for about 25 years. Um, our firm, APPI Energy, as Tom mentioned, has worked with your association now for many years, working with members to help them understand and transact effectively in the deregulated electricity and natural gas states around the nation. We also work with clients on um, uh, energy account data capture management and, and understanding your usage profiles. We'll talk more about that later, but um, we appreciate all the business we've had so far and Tom does a great job with these. And when I, we were talking about this six or eight months or so ago at an industry event, Tom thought of the idea, so I thought it was great to join Kevin today. So I'm looking forward to it. 
Well, one of the things I'm excited about members uh, with Appy Energy being our partner is they're endorsed by, over, what is it, 155 associations? Yeah, 158 associations now, yeah. 158 national associations and local associations endorsed them to handle their energy procurement. So very excited to have them as a partner of ours, and they do a great job, and we're going to get into the details of that. So now, Kevin, share with everybody kind of where, you, where you're from and what you, and what you do there at uh, uh, Honeywell. Sure, sure. Thanks, Tom. Um, I appreciate the invite here. It's um, glad to be on here with you and, and Mike. Um, so I, I had a, a fun road to get to where I'm at. I've been with Honeywell Thermal Solutions for uh, about three years now, but I've been in the, the industrial combustion industry for about 20. Um, started as a, as a field service technician working on boilers and process heating equipment for about 10 years and then moved into the sales side of the business. Um, and I've been in the sales side of the business for about 10 years between regional sales, uh, global accounts, and now uh, sales management. So I've always been tied into the, the process heating industry. And um, because of my relationship with Mr. Jim Roberts, which I think many of you know, um, he's been a, a, a boss and a mentor for me for a while. I've been really tied to the, to the metals industry over the years. So um, this is a great opportunity for me to, to join you guys today. Thank you. Well, Kevin, you know, when you said it was a, a great journey to get here, I thought you were talking about the weather. <laughs> that too. I, that too. I, saw, I saw on the Weather Channel last night a, a video they were showing a weather report from Elkhorn, Illinois, which is right there in your backyard. And I'm like, I'm in Florida. I don't know how you drive in that stuff. There's no way. No we way. got plenty of the white stuff. So if you guys want some, come on, come and get it. We got the, guy that, the guy that you see turning his wheel, hitting his brakes at the same time, sliding through the curve into the embankment, that's me. <laughs> That is definitely me. And I know we got a lot of members on here that are laughing at that because they're in the snow right now. So, but hey, let's just jump into this. So Mike, first yeah. question, how did the efficiency solutions that Kevin's going to talk about integrate with the electric and natural electricity and natural gas supply contracts that you effectuate for our members? Yeah, good. Thanks, Tom. That's a good place to start to integrate both of our core competencies here. Um, many of your members, uh, manufacturers across the nation uh, we, that we've worked with are constantly evaluating and looking at, and in fact, implementing different efficiency programs and measures to lower their usage profiles to better manage the, their spend. It's important that they understand that if they have an existing electricity and or natural gas a supply contract with a competitive supplier, that the efficiency program that they're implementing can in fact be impacted by that uh, supply contract, actually vice versa in that um, if there's certain provisions in their uh, supply contracts, they can be triggered when there's a big swing in a usage profile, for instance, that could result from the energy efficiency program that, that Kevin and consultants like Kevin can implement for your members. So a couple examples, um, all members you should, if, if you're in the midst of an efficiency program or, or you're considering it, you know, look into your supply contracts, both electricity and gas, and see if they have a couple of provisions like this. One is called your bandwidth or your swing provision. That speaks to your usage profile that you've had the last two years of the suppliers, drop it through their algorithms, and then come up with a pricing model based upon your usage profile. Well, they've priced your account based upon that profile. So if your profile changes dramatically during the term of the supply contract, and you may have a two, three, four, five, or six-year supply contract, then if the contract language allows it, the supplier can, uh, uh, can uh, modify your actual cost per kWh or cost uh, per decatherm based upon a dramatic change in your usage profile. One of the ways to avoid that very straightforwardly is, and we always do this, is we negotiate into our contracts 100% swing provision. You can get less, but that way it doesn't matter if the manufacturer's usage profile is gonna change up because they're operating a cycles change or because they do efficiency. Another contract provision that you want to look for that blends in there is something called a material adverse change clause, where again, it's kind of uh, keyed into your usage, but it's also keyed into your operations. So that if you have a material adverse change in your overall operations or your usage profile, again, your supplier may have the opportunity to adjust your pricing structure. So going in, you may have, uh, you may have understood and felt that you had a fixed price no matter what your usage profile was like, but that may not be the case if your contract contains one of these up provisions. Suppliers don't necessarily have to invoke it, but they have the opportunity how to do that. Right. So those okay. are examples of things to look for. 
So, so Kevin, when you hear that and you hear how the contracts are connected to efficiencies, let's jump into efficiency. So you walk into a heat treat plant and you start looking around at what's going on in that plant. What are some of the common things that you see immediately, like the low lying fruit that you say, okay, that's an inefficiency. That's, that's eating energy. That's throwing money out the door. What are a couple of big things that heat treaters should be looking for when they're looking at inefficiencies? No, that's a great question because a lot of the times those things are just visual things that, mm -hmm. that you're literally walking through a facility and, and looking for. And, and coming through that service background, um, going in and starting up equipment, um, I was just kind of brought up looking around, right? So you go in there to start up maybe a brand new piece of equipment, but you're looking at some of the older stuff sitting right next to it or in the next bay. And, and one of the first things that, that always popped out to me that is a key indicator that, that the system is just not optimized is when you see flames shooting out of something somewhere, right? Right. Um, and, and sometimes it's on purpose, right? So I, I know there's affluent pilots that we're burning off things. So that, there's a purpose for that. What I'm talking about is if you've got radiant tubes or some gaps in a door or something like that, where you've got flames um, basically extending from stacks outside of the furnace. And what that means, We've got unburned fuels going through the process system that are, are not heating the operation, right? They're heating the air outside. And so you're paying for that gas to go into the system, um, but you're, you're actually heating the outside air instead of heating the process. So that's one key thing that I'm looking at when I'm walking through a facility. Is there flame, are there flames shooting out somewhere that they shouldn't be? The second one I'm looking but, at. Wait, wait, wait. If there's no flames, the coolness of being in a heat treat plant, go away. <laughs> that is true. That is true. And uh, it's, it's not as easy to bake your lunch or, right. or something like that either. So, um, but, you know, we drive down the cool factor to increase the efficiency, right? Right, right. <laughs> Couldn't resist. Yeah. The, the second one that I'm looking for is, um, is soot. So carbon buildup, soot. It's a light substance. It floats around like crazy, and you can see it really easily, typically. It gets a little bit harder to heat, see in a heat treat shop because um, a lot of times there's oils in the air and things like that, so it, it, it tends to stick and not float around as much. But what I'm looking for is, do I see black soot anywhere? Is it around exhaust tubes? Is it underneath burners? Is it near uh, ventilation systems? And so what that's telling me is, some, some combustion system somewhere in this facility near that exhaust point is off ratio. So typically I'm fuel rich, leaving high carbon content on the discharge of that. And that's doing two things, right? So it's showing that your combustion efficiency, your pure combustion efficiency is not, uh, is not great because your air to gas ratios are off, car, car, uh, causing the soot. But the added disadvantage to this is that soot coats the equipment. And so if it's a radiant tube and the burner is running off ratio and you're sooting, that soot is coating the inside of that radiant tube, causing um, a thermal barrier. So basically it's insulating the inside of that tube. So you're not transferring that heat as well through that carbon layer to the steel, to the process, right? right. So that's the second thing I'm looking for when I'm walking through a facility. Um, the last one I'm looking for is, is not as obvious a lot of times, but it, it's still a key indicator that something is, is not right. And a lot of times it's not the burner in this instance, but what I'm looking for is our, our heat marks. Are there places where paint's burned off or mm -hmm. changed colors? Um, and, and I know a lot of the times old equipment, it's all different colors, right? Um, so I'm looking at places by doors, by exhaust ducts, by burner inlets, where there's transition points between insulation um, because a, a key efficiency driver is the burner and the combustion system, but it's also the insulation process or properties of these pieces of equipment. So if you've got gaps in doors, um, failing refactory, you can have the most efficient combustion system on the planet, but your overall system efficiency is extremely low because you're not holding that heat in the process. You're allowing it to escape through gaps in the doors or through gaps in refactory. So those, that, that's another key factor that really needs to be looked at when you're looking at an overall system efficiency. So obviously to not have those things happen, you'd obviously want to prevent them and look at indicators. So 
with combustion being such a driving force, what indicators should a heat treater be looking for to maximize that combustion efficiency? So, so the, the, the things that we can look at to, to improve that combustion efficiency, you know, what I typically start with is, are, are, are you doing annual preventative maintenance, right? So the preventative maintenance is, is something that you can do internally if you've got a good process and skilled people or can be outsourced um, through burner manufacturers, the oven or furnace manufacturers usually offer it. Um, and then there's local service companies that offer it. Um, but what you're looking at with a preventative maintenance program should be more than just looking at um, is the burner igniter uh, clean and functional, right? Are my air filters clean and functional? Those are things you wanna look at, um, of course. But what the PMs or preventive maintenance should also be looking for are some of these other things. Is the tuning correct? Are my safety devices correct? Um, it, are, are all the process pieces of equipment, the doors opening and closing and seating properly? Um, they should be looking at all these different factors. Um, just simply checking the tuning of the burner can increase combustion efficiency by you know, three to 5% easily, depending on how inefficient the burner set up. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the big drivers of this is something as simple as um, environmental changes. So going from a cold season where it is right now, where everybody's got their doors closed off, right? Because it's 28 degrees outside in the north and they're venting the, the exhaust ducts out of the plant and putting your plant into a, a negative pressure condition, right? And so that's gonna impact how much combustion air you can put through the combustion system and which is gonna impact your fuel to air ratio. You take that to the other extreme when it's summer and it's 100 degrees outside, all your doors are open and you're venting outside, but you're also blowing air in because you've got fans or you've got um, makeup air systems or cooling systems that are trying to cool the facility then all of a sudden your plant goes into a positive pressure situation. Now you've got abundance of combustion air that right. you can push through the system and it's gonna throw off your fuel air ratios. And so just having somebody come in and check those settings in those different conditions has the potential of saving you a, a, a pretty good percentage on, on the overall fuel usage just by making sure the burners are tuned and on right. Ratio. Now, we have been doing a lot of committed articles in our MTI Insider monthly newsletter that comes from our weekly emails on predictive maintenance. I mean, can you speak to the process of having a strategy? Because I know we had, I had some conversations with some members about, he said, the moment we started having a strategy to take a furnace down to do predictive and preventative maintenance as opposed to waiting for it to break, we could actually gauge and manage our workflow and production through those so we didn't slow down. There was no downtime because we effectively managed the process with the furnace because we could predict when it was going to go down and we needed maintenance and we could do our workflow because it's so hard to do that in the moment when a furnace just drops and goes dead. So any thoughts on the process of a strategy to actually have a maintenance, preventative maintenance future strategy? No, it's, it's a huge advantage to have that strategy for all the points that you just said, but, but also for the points of, of scheduling your workflow, right? Or scheduling your, your, your people in to do the process, right? So, if a, if a furnace just shuts down and you've got to bring in outside people, a lot of times you can't get those guys the same day. So you're waiting a day or two or three days to get the right people in to fix it. Um, we are starting to uh, bring in the analytics that are going to help with that uh, predictive maintenance. So Thermal IQ is a new technology that we'll talk about as well that, that basically is going to data log your failures, your consumption, your uptime, it can data log a lot of different points that you can use and analyze to say, you know what, I consistently have failures after six months of runtime. Right. So I need to do my preventative maintenance every four or five months instead of waiting six months. Um, the other way of doing that is by trial and error, right? In the past, you would have to go and, and you would set up your maintenance schedule for once a quarter or, or once a half. And if you weren't reducing your, your failures, then you would have to increase your increments, right? And it right. took some trial and error to do that. 
but the new age of analytics and be able to capture that information through thermal IQ is speeding up that process, right? Because you're getting data all the time, real time, and you're getting the analytics tools to interpret that into something you can use. Well, it's awesome to be able to say, use that data to actually literally predict exactly when something needs to come down so it doesn't take your downtime to you. So one last question before we move into Mike, talking about some strategies. on top. So, so what are some of the top items that you can use to address the impact of combustion efficiency? So, so one of the biggest things that we look at right now is, of course, preheated combustion air or heat recovery. Mm -hmm. So, so one, one of the things that I believe is, is underused is, is a chart. It's, it's, a, it's a bit of an eye chart, but I'll, I'll show it to you here. It's called the available heat chart. Yeah. And so, so what I'm looking at in this chart is it's, it's giving you an idea of your combustion efficiency based on your air temperature, your combustion air temperature, the amount of combustion air you're using it, it, regarding excess air, and your furnace temperature. So just, just one indication of at 2,000 degrees, okay? So if at 2,000 degree furnace temperature, which is probably a, a moderate or a high temperature for a lot of the people on, on the call here, at 10% excess air cold, you're running at 45% combustion efficiency. So what that's telling us is that 45% of the, the heat energy that we're generating um, through the combustion process is actually going to heat your, your product, only 45%. The rest of that energy that you're creating is going to heat up the air and the gas to get to that 2,000 degrees, right? So that's a pretty crummy combustion efficiency. That is essentially a non-negotiable data point, right? If you're firing into a 2,000 degree furnace and you've got 70 degree air coming in at 10% excess air, that's just where you're at from a combustion efficiency perspective. Just by taking that preheated air up to 400 degrees, we go from 45% to 55% efficiency. Right. We gain 10% efficiency by preheating the air 400 degrees. If we can take that up to 1,000 degrees, we're looking at going to 65% efficiency. So we wow. just had a, a 20% jump in combustion efficiency just by preheating combustion air. Right. And so that's one of the biggest drivers of combustion efficiency that we look at. Um, there's usually a cost associated that, with that, right? So we're looking at heat exchangers mm -hmm. that we have to use to capture that heat to preheat the air. And there's a lot of different methods in, in doing that, external heat exchangers, internal heat exchangers within the burner. Um, but one nice thing that technology is playing into this is in the past, most of those heat exchangers were all steel-based. Right. So you're limited, uh, limited on the temperature that you could really push through that. Um, or they were pure ceramic expensive. Now with the advancement of silicon carbides and be able to make different shapes and internalize those in the burners, now all of a sudden we can take preheat that's 2,000 degrees. And right. run it through a silicon carbide heat exchanger and capture that heat and reuse it in combustion and to improve the combustion efficiency. Well, what I love hearing what you do, what you're saying, Kevin, and what we're about to lead into with Mike is anytime you can maximize energy efficiencies and buy right, it creates money at the bottom line distinctly to provide things like jobs and healthcare and uh, more equipment upgrades. So it's, that's why it's such an important topic in my view is to get those energy efficiencies and then be partnered with somebody who can, who can help you buy right in the marketplace. Because here's what I always know about outsourcing anything is your customer's always someone else's prospect. And the more time you're sitting here looking at the screens and the Henry Hyde and all the different the indices out there for energy, someone's talking to your customer about why they should be coming to them. So that's why, Mike, I think it's important what you guys do and, and you are just pounding the technology and the data. So what are some of the account data management programs that you're being used to help customers out there manage and procure their energy better for themselves? Yeah, just following up on um, you know, Kevin's approach using data and the analytics around the data to, to be more efficient and uh, profitable. The same thing is occurring in space in the, in the energy uh, procurement space. Um, we've done a lot of due diligence on several different vendors over the last several years, and we've landed on, on one that we, that we really liked. It's uh, created a fantastic portal-based data capture a solution enterprise. Um, we've uh, negotiated very favorable uh, relationship structure with them. So that service is available to all MTI members um, if, if they're talking with us and working with us. And basically what it is is that um, all of your members' electricity, 
natural gas, you can put water, you can put sewer, you can put waste removal, you can put oil, you can put any, any type of monthly spend or utility or account based uh, uh, service or need that your operation has uh, into the portal platform. And then your uh, management team has immediate access to all of your account information through a portal uh, 24 seven worldwide. You can access it via your smartphone or your desktop. And it allows you to instantly see and understand what your spend has been over the prior 24 months, what it is this month, what your budgeting for spend to be over the next 12, 24, 36 months, as long as you'd like to do it, and do it on, a, on your data and your usage profiles, your history, your spend, so that you can very effectively budget what your energy costs are gonna be. And then when you have that data available <clears throat> at the ready like that, you're able to uh, truly analyze um, what impacts efficiency programs are actually having in your, in your plant or in your operations or your building. So for instance, if, if Eric's team comes in and initiates some of those efficiency programs, you already have set up in the account data management platform and system, your two year or three year history of usage and profiles, benchmarks, all the data is there. So now an efficiency program uh, is um, initiated. You can track it every month, what's happening. And then you know, you'll truly have the data and do the analytics around what impact that's gonna have. And that translates immediately over to your budget and you can project all that going forward as well. Um, uh, one other important, there are several other important features and tools available in these data management uh, platforms now. One of the things is, is that I was sharing with you all uh, earlier before we started the event today and talking about the weather is that um, the platform and tools that we use, um, one aspect of it is all weather normalized. So if your plant, just by way of example, used a million kWh or 100,000 decatherms of natural gas in November of 2017, and then in 2000, uh, excuse me, in November 2018, you used 1.1 million kWh or you know, 110,000 decatherms, Someone who's looking at that information two or three months down the road, which is too late to be looking at it. If you had it in a portal, you could see it right away. But when they get a report in the next quarter, they go, wait a minute, you know, your, your usage and our spend was up, my gosh, it was up 10, 12, 15% in November. Well, if your numbers are weather normalized and you, in fact, see now that the temperature was actually eight or nine degrees colder, or you hadn't implemented a certain efficiency program and now you're gonna do it, you can manage that better, you can truly understand it. Right. Um, so the tools are uh, very effective and have been created by folks who started in the energy industry on which we like. So it's very intuitive and it's, it's very resourceful for the, for, for the member. That's exciting that you're bringing data to the table and analytics that can help people, as I said, do predictive yeah. thought processes that can help mm -hmm. you really, I always call it predicting with precision because to mm -hmm. me, that's, it, it takes the guesswork out of it. And I think that's what Kevin was speaking of and you. So talk about a little bit. I mean, you spend a lot of time in BC. Is there anything on the energy policy front that members listening should be, have their mind soaked into that could cause energy prices to rise, demand, whatever? Yeah, before I shift to that, I, I did want to mention on the data analytics piece. And Tom, uh, you know this. We have, uh, we have a sister company here called the Energy Research Council which is led by a, uh, Dr. Jim Moore as a PhD in data analytics. He's been doing this for 40 years. And he has uh, created proprietary uh, databases and data analytics around all of the competitive electricity prices uh, that we receive in here every day from 50 plus suppliers around the nation. So that your members, our clients benefit from all that data tracking, all the benchmarking of price trends, all the analytics around that. That's proprietary to us and available to your members. Awesome. Again, data analytics side, using information that's already there in a much more effective way. Right. Being over to DC, and um, as you mentioned earlier, we are associated with and exclusively endorsed consultant for 158 National State Trade Associations. So we spend quite a bit of time in DC, talk with their economists, uh, talk with their legislative representatives on their staffs about, about policy changes and what's going on. And, um, what we've seen over the last 18 months since President Trump took over has been a, um, a, a softening of um, policy uh, decisions and uh, uh, influences around, you know, slowing uh, energy processes down. In other words, mm -hmm. kind of to help speed up 
process of approvals for pipelines, speed up uh, grid structure improvements, speed up um, other types of uh, programs to make energy uh, more available, less expensively. So that's definitely been a policy decision now that has worked. That's helped drive energy prices down in part. That's due in large measure as well to the, uh, to the fracking technology, which is you know, a developed in Marcellus and the Bartlett and the other shale plays. But that in turn could have, been, could have been stymied or slowed down if policies had been laid in. Right. To that. And that's right. done mostly on the state level. So you, see, so you see states such as our home state here in Maryland and New York that have very much limited uh, fracking. So our gas development, in fact, oil development around that has been limited uh, to nothing. Whereas in Pennsylvania, Ohio, West Virginia, parts of Kentucky, where the states have encouraged uh, gas exploration and, and gas production using fracking technology, those states, and, or at least certainly parts of those states, are flourishing around energy production, which is a policy decision at the state level, which has really as much or more impact sometimes than the federal policies. So. I always encourage members, whether you're in Ohio, you're in Michigan, Pennsylvania, wherever you are, Florida, there are things that you could be doing and considering working with your local and uh, state representatives around energy policy that can help you keep your costs down, both in your plants as well as in your home and in your schools, et cetera. So there's a lot of ways to impact energy-related policy in a positive way. Absolutely. So, so shifting a little bit to the future, I read an article yesterday mm -hmm. that they're looking at energy prices are going to begin to rise starting mm -hmm. next year. So can you speak to that as well as, is there any strategies members should be thinking about knowing the ups and downs of energy that they should be considering in the next six to 12 months? Of course, of course. In fact, energy prices have already started moving up going into this winter. Over the last uh, two and a half years or so, we've been at, at or near all time lows for retail electricity prices and natural gas prices. Um, the, that shifted in some markets, uh, for instance, in Texas, when they had early heat in May and June, we saw uh, price spikes then. They, st they came off a little bit, but now across the country, natural gas prices have risen. The, the Henry Hub and the NYMEX prices are up in the $4 range, which is, we haven't seen that in, in several years. But what's that, what that's done is that for electricity and natural gas prices for for a delivery in December of this year, January, February, and March of next year, those prices are about 15 to 25% higher now than they were just a year ago. And they're certainly quite a bit higher than they were off the all-time lows. However, what we see starting next April is a significant drop in natural gas prices and concurrently electricity prices that, that, that track that fairly closely starting next April. So they start to come off um, considerably so, such that prices are still above where they were about a year ago, but they're still in the low round, the low 15 to 20% level in, in terms of all time. And then in 2020, 2021, 2022, we actually see prices that are very attractive now. In fact, we have manufacturers all across the nation that are locking in the supply contracts to carry them out through 2020. 23, 24, even into 2025, because those outer year prices are what's called backwardated. They're actually lower than the prices for the next six months. So the longer term contracts can often offer uh, lower price uh, certainty uh, with a fixed price for, for clients now. Um, and I would mention that in that regard around price discovery, I would encourage your members to not wait until they get a few months before a contract expires. Oftentimes, Manufacturers say, well, I want to do this once a year. I'm going to do it once every 18 months. I do it in March or I do it in September. Those are the, the traditional shoulder months. Well, that's not the case any longer. We've seen that the markets change so that there's not your uh, accentuated or prominent shoulder months any longer. You really need to be looking at the market year round. Our team is available to help your members do that. And no matter when their current contract expires, electricity or gas, even out as far as if their contract expires in 2021 or 2022. We can get price discovery now for them to review and whether or not that they choose to act on it now, they'll become more intelligent about the future markets. They'll be able to establish some benchmarks and trends. And over time, they can peg, hey, if the market goes 3% lower from here or 5% lower or 5% higher from here, 
I'm willing to buy for 2022, 23, and 24, for instance, and just lock it in. And be right. Or, or buy a certain percentage of my consumption needs. So the tools are there, the data is there, the analytics are there through their consultancy operation opportunities here with us. They can access that information at any time. So, so one, one, last, one last question before I go back to Kevin on, on technology. So is there anything that you can put your, hand, your, your, your mind on mm -hmm. that we're not seeing that could cause energy prices to rise in a way that people would want to take action sooner than later, such as transportation opportunities, other foreign country demands that take gas over there, mm -hmm. those that here mm -hmm. that drive up the demand overall, mm -hmm. uh, energy, anything that you see out there we may not be thinking of that, that we need to pay attention to that might make gas go up? Yeah, some, some things to watch. Uh, for the first time in our history, just in the last several months, we've become a, a net exporter of natural gas. So we are exporting natural gas now in increasingly high levels through pipelines in New Mexico, which is booming from an industrial sector, at least parts of Mexico are. Uh, in fact, many of your members may have affiliates down there, mm -hmm. if our clients do. In addition, um, uh, natural gas is now being uh, exported all around the world as liquefied natural gas. Uh, the LNG terminals are uh, coming online and rapidly growing in terms of the gas that they're exporting. Right. So that means then is that our gas prices here are now becoming more subject to prices across the world where they're two or three times as high in Europe. They're three to four times as high in, China, in, uh, in India and in, uh, Japan and uh, Singapore for instance. So that's a natural tendency or push to pull our gas prices up to get closer to those prices as we export more. But the, but the forward markets, at least for the time being, for those years I've been talking about, have anticipated that. It's, it's pretty much baked into the prices. So I'm, I'm not that concerned about increasing exports. I think, in fact, I think that's great. That's helping our economy grow and thrive mm -hmm. and helping us all across the board there in terms of trade balances, you know, et cetera, and uh, gross, natural, uh, me, gross natural product, et cetera. But the other thing that I'd be looking for is that um, from the regulatory point of view to kind of circle back to that, yep. uh, you know, we're going to see a change in the house in January, February. So we're going to see, I'm t you're going to see a halt to progressive energy policy because it's not going to get through both, uh, both, uh, house and Senate. Now, even the president yeah. will sign it. Now the president can still push forward things from a regulatory perspective through the department of energy and, and through some of his, um, administrative options right but as the legislation goes i don't think we're going to see any changes on the energy side i think it's going to hold pretty firm and then if things change further in two years and president trump either does not run or is not reelected, i think it's wide open you want to be looking for that and see what that may have that may in fact swing the other way again and cause further regulatory costs to be layered onto the energy sector which eventually translate down through to all of us as the customer well, the good news is, is we're going to do this again in about six months. You can bring that stuff back to the members and make <laughs> good choices. So, so yeah, real quick. So that, on, yeah, I'll show you those forward charts. That's awesome. So, Mike, uh, that's great. So, so Kevin, uh, back to the technology front. After you hear what Mike's talking about pricing and things impacting just gas pricing and looking at energy efficiency. So what kind of technology is being played out in the world of energy efficiencies on your side of combustion that can help members do that predictive stuff? So, so a couple of things, I'll segment that into, into two points here, right? So uh, I'll start with the, the, the new products and, and technology for improving the efficiency. And I'll kind of end with the, the products that are, that are monitoring that efficiency mm -hmm. that we use for analytics and, and predictive uh, process. So the first part of it is, is the new products, right? For driving improved efficiency. And I talked about that a little bit earlier with the, the ceramics. Our ability to, to produce ceramics in, in different shapes at lower costs has really improved our ability to, uh, to supply heat exchangers at a competitive price, right? So mm -hmm. in the past, if you looked at a ceramic heat exchanger, um, it was hard to, to generate an ROI because of the upfront cost of that product compared to the fuel savings you were going to generate. Um, that gap is closed significantly with our ability to, to create different geometries in ceramics. So right now, the, the direct fired self-recuperative burners um, and uh, self-regenerative burners, things like that, um, those products, I say they're new. They've been on the market for a little while, but 
the prices are getting better and better and the technology is getting higher and higher, driving efficiencies up. So, so that's one. The other aspect of that is really that fuel air ratio control. So in the past, if you wanted to look at mass flow control or really tight ratio control, you were talking about a large price tag coming with that. And a lot of times the, the benefit of going to that precise ratio control um, was not outweighed by the value we're getting back on the cost savings, on the fuel savings. Right. That gap is closing as well with different technology for, um, for monitoring air and gas flows um, to help improve your fuel efficiency through just pure air gas ratio control. Um, so those are the, the last one is really just the technology in um, low emissions burners. So mm -hmm. emissions are driving standards as well, right? right. So, and that's a key driver in a lot of different market segments. Um, and in the past, one of the best ways to drive down your NOx emissions, per se, was to reduce your efficiency, essentially. You were rising your excess air to meet a NOx or emissions number. Technology is allowing us to do um, better things with burners to basically meet these lower NOx emissions numbers with the same excess air through right. volume combustion, basically, or flameless combustion, um, staged combustion. Um, some other processes there that are allowing us to meet the NOx emissions numbers without sacrificing efficiency. Um, so those are the three big things I've seen that have been changing over the years as far as uh, improving fuel efficiency through technology. So then the last one is, is essentially that data collection point. So um, there haven't always been a lot of products out there that, that tie into the, the combustion process that can monitor um, your flame safety, your temperature controller, uh, gas and air flow meters. Um, and basically, we've got a product now, it's called Thermal IQ, that, that does all those monitoring components. Right. And basically, it's, um, it's a cell-based service, so it's, um, in, and it works, downloads to an app. Now, We've got some preliminary analytics functions built into it already, but that analytics side is really the future of this, right? Mm -hmm. So first we're collecting this data and then what are we going to do with it? Right. And that really drives to what Mike's saying is if, if we keep growing the analytics section of that, all of a sudden you can look on your smartphone and you can compare your uptime and your fuel consumption um, throughout this year or last year or, and then predict what it should be next year for certain times, um, environmental conditions outside, and and that's going to educate you on when you need to buy the you know entering into these agreements, when you can get the lowest price and the biggest bang for the buck. So that's one of the biggest changes in the industry that I'm seeing is that that data collection um, product that's going to give us the ability to drive analytics. Well, with, with, as we're hearing here today, with efficiencies and pricing and time to buy so vastly connected, it's exciting to see the technology that's coming to the table to help connect the two so you can exactly. know when the energy efficiencies are right at the moment or going up in the moment to help you buy energy in a timely fashion with, with companies like API. So, so my one last quick question for you is, um, I mean, we talk about energy and I mean, we talk about gas, electric, but what about solar and some other processes? Do y'all get into analyzing any of those other sources of energy? Yes, um, we don't have uh, the engineers on our staff full time with expertise in solar battery technology. But again, we we have relationships in place with some other trusted consultants that that have core competencies in solar and battery technology, artificial intelligence tied to those systems and, and programs. So that the distributed generation world that people hear about is really talking about um, business owners. Uh, plant managers using their data, using their information uh, in a coordinated way to combine with a solar array or backup battery storage technology to, to buy energy in the lower cost times at night, store it during you know, those periods when it's less expensive than use it during the day, during peak periods, et cetera. All this can be combined with uh, solar, again, battery technology, artificial intelligence, it's just growing so quickly. The intelligence there is, is there, and it's, it's, it's all proven now. There's nothing that's, that's bleeding edge or cutting edge. These are technologies that are well proven. They're, they're cost efficient. They have ROIs that can make sense for your, 
your members. So what we do here is that uh, we're more than happy to, to work with a member uh, to take a look at a, at a proposal that they have in front of them, or if they're considering something, um, we can uh, refer in other consultants with core competencies in these areas. We've been involved here at Appy now in the last four years and 15, we have our 16th solar program ongoing now. We've got two hydro plant operations going on where clients will be off takers for that. Um, we have battery technology that's been installed with many uh, food processors and manufacturers around the country. And, and that's a growing, growing trend there. Again, using the data that you're creating and then measuring it against other industry standards, things that you know, Kevin's talking about and benchmarking, and you'll be able to be more efficient and, and at the end of the day, save money. Awesome. Well, real quick, Kevin, 60 seconds, big takeaway. What's one thing you'd leave members with today on energy efficiencies? I, I get the big thing I want to leave the members with today is um, is actually two points. So the first one is make time to check your equipment, right? So set up the preventative maintenance. Have somebody, whether it's internal or external, come in, go through your equipment on a regular basis. This is going to help you drive uptime. Um, find issues before they've been festering for months, days, weeks, years. Um, and address them that's going to improve that thermal efficiency. Then the second point is, is that data collection. So that thermal IQ aspect of it, the more information you can get and collect, the more power you have to analyze that information and use it for a multiple you know, aspects, whether it's buying energy or managing your process, data is king. So find ways to gather that information so you can use it. Okay, Mike, final thoughts in 60 seconds on just what you want members to take away. Okay, two things real quick. First of all, that um, prices now are higher than they have been the last year, year and a half. And in these next three to four, five months now, uh, particularly on the natural gas side, but also electricity side, prices are high. If you can shift your next contract to start anytime from next April or later, and maybe work off of a utility supply rate this winter, or perhaps you're already covered for that time period, which would be great, then you should see your, your price quotes coming in from, from suppliers to start next April, or certainly late next year or next year lower than they would be if you were starting in a prompt month of December, January, February, March. It's number one. Number two, uh, related to that, again, those forward price curves are still at or near all-time lows for, 21, for 2021 and 22. So don't wait to get price discovery either get it yourself or work with a consultant, begin to see what those forward markets are offering you around pricing. You might want to lock in a certain percentage of your load now, take some risk off the table. You might want to lock it all in. Prices are very attractive. Then finally, back will we'll come full circle around the data. There's tremendous opportunities available in data capture around your accounts, electricity, gas, oil, propane, whatever accounts that you have monthly spend on, you can capture that information very cost effectively, then use it to be a better steward of your energy and uh, be more profitable. Well, Mike, Kevin, that's awesome, awesome input. And, and members, one thing I want you to take away from this, this broadcast is we're in an eight year workplace shortage of labor out there. And the reason it's so important for you to spend time with your employees and your customers and not buying energy, you need to be partnered with our, one of our 64 suppliers, three of them are energy companies. Mike's company, Happy Energy, happens to be the official energy provider, but we have three. You want to be partnering with someone who's buying right for you and helping you get those energy efficiencies because we're in a very customer experience oriented future and you need to be making sure your customers are absolutely satisfied with their experience with you with doing heat treating as well as you want to make sure every employee feels really good about coming to work every day because poachers out there are using LinkedIn or trying to come after every employee in every industry and you need to make sure you have a workplace culture where people want to come to every day and they're recruiting people to come work for you instead of sitting in front of the computer and trying to buy your energy. I just want to encourage in that way, focus on your employees and make sure they lo love coming to work and focus on your customers that they love being a, a customer of yours. And I promise you those future is going to be bright for you. But Mike, Kevin, thank you so much for all your input today. Members, just remember always, you're not just strong, you're MTI strong. Look for us in December where we're going to talk about employee engagement in the employee workplace and how you can maximize that. Thank you very much for your support and we'll see you soon. Thank you. Thanks.